The 2024 US election is a year away, but legal battles around it are on in full swing. What is the latest from Donald Trump's challenges in the courtrooms? The tech world has been consumed by the crisis at OpenAI, which is behind ChatGPT. What lessons do we learn from this corporate battle? This is The Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Former US President Donald Trump is dealing with a raft of cases around the elections of 2020 whose, elect, whose results he is accused of trying to subvert and these cases might have an impact on the next election as well. A couple of days ago, a Colorado court held that while Trump had conducted insurrectionary activity during January 21, 2021, that's the attack on the US Capitol, it was not clear if this was enough to strike him off the ballot. An appeals court meanwhile is hearing Trump on a targeted gag order that prevents him from speaking out against those involved in an election subversion case. For all these legal details, we go to Anish. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Looks like uh, tracking the legal trials and you know battles of Donald Trump is a full-fledged beat. So much, uh, so much happening across so many states in the United States, that too. Uh, but let's start with some of the latest ones. We, we know one, for instance, there is something about uh, him challenging a bar on, uh, on him speaking about some of these issues. There was also a Colorado uh, court judgment recently. So could you maybe take us through what they were? Well, the gag order pretty much uh, was in reaction to his statements against uh, the presiding judge, uh, the clerk of the judge, and also the attorney that was uh, you know, prosecuting him. So basically, it, it's a very limited uh, kind of gag order, which prevents him from uh, speaking personally or, uh, you know, or in terms of their profession as well. Uh, uh, during the span of the trial itself. Uh, and maybe he can make statements after that. But basically, it con uh, currently just limits his, uh, some of his statements during the trial uh, so that there is no, uh, you know, no kind of campaign being built around uh, the trials, which, which is what he does very often. You have to remember that uh, pretty much every case that he talks about, uh, he has pretty much created a campaign around these cases at this moment. He has attacked his uh, not only uh, the people who are suing him, but also uh, the judges, the anybody, anybody who is seen to be at any, at a, you know, uh, in any degree, uh, you know, being affecting uh, his chances to the presidency, or for that matter, finding him uh, guilty. Uh, and uh, even though uh, the current case, the case in question, did not come with a verdict as of now. He has already made statements and uh, lifting, you know, this temporary, there was a temporary lifting of that uh, gag order. And we saw that immediately he made statements against the judge, uh, you know, within just days, uh, almost uh, a day or two, maybe uh, that, that uh, within that he made a very objectionable statement, pretty much calling them to be arrested or jailed or, you know, kept under, uh, kept under prison uh, for, uh, you know, going against him, basically. And so this is uh, pretty much has been his modus operandi. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, a, a bench of three judges are now uh, looking at this case uh, clearly shows that they are trying to make it as a, uh, you know, problem of free speech. But uh, the judges have also, uh, you know, expressed reservations uh, about, uh, you know, this being a matter of free speech and this being just a matter of, you know, uh, a defendant uh, somebody who has been uh, indicted for a, a felony uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, to be making statements that can compromise uh, the, you know, the process of the, ju the judicial process itself, but also might also include and, you know, attract some kind of attacks on the people, uh, you know, who might be uh, either trying him or, uh, you know, trying the case itself. So these uh, factors are pretty much at the heart of the case. But it clearly shows that this has been his very common tactic across the board. He has made all of these cases, his campaign issue, uh, made it seem as if he is being, you know, very uh, wrongfully uh, victimized or persecuted by, uh, be it Democrats or, you know, the judicial process or anybody who has uh, seen to be uh, in opposition to him. And uh, that has pretty much become his campaign at this point. Even if, if he's not attacking uh, the challenges uh, within the Republican Party against his candidacy, 
he's attacking uh, the people who are suing him or the judges who are presiding his case. So pretty much this has become part of his campaign right now. And that in itself has its own set of repercussions on the long run. Anish, in this context, of course, another case going on in Colorado as well, which uh, sought to, uh, you know, bar him from the pre contesting the next round of presidency. Could you maybe tell us, take us to that as well? Well, this is, uh, the verdict is in. Basically, uh, the judge uh, rejected the plea itself. Uh, but it's a very curious uh, conclusion by the judge because the judge does seem to indicate that he might have his hand in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in uh, inspiring an insur insurrection, which is the only thing that prevents anybody from uh, running for the presidency. Uh, but the judge's contention was that the state uh, court and state uh, processes does not have uh, the power to uh, prevent someone from uh, running for office, or for that matter, uh, whether or not the amendment in question, the 14th Amendment, uh, deals, uh, you know, deals with the presidency itself, uh, even though that was the very intention uh, of the amendment at the time, because it was the post-Civil War uh, creation. It was made so that Confederates who had surrendered uh, do not get the chance to run for high offices and, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, influence the government uh, process uh, in the post-Civil War United States. So this is pretty much, uh, that was the intention, and very similar is the case. And this is not the first time. This is the third such court uh, that has rejected uh, a plea on this very uh, basis. Uh, earlier in Michigan and Minnesota, we had seen uh, the courts, uh, the judges actually uh, refusing to hear the case, rejecting the plea, based on very similar uh, pretext, uh, conclusions being that whether uh, that the courts do not either do not have the power to uh, prevent him from con uh, contesting, or, uh, you know, it does not have the power to interfere in primaries. That is what uh, the Michigan court uh, order had, uh, you know, ruled, uh, pretty much opening up the chances for uh, the people who had filed the lawsuit to maybe challenge him after the primaries during the presidential campaign. Nevertheless, this is uh, there is also we must remember there is a uh, federal uh, attempt to indict uh, Trump for these very same charges because that might be the only thing that can actually prevent him uh, any kind of criminal conviction uh, can, will not uh, you know prevent that uh, from happening or you know prevent his nomination even and uh, this is pretty much a situation where uh, obviously state courts are dealing with uh, such cases. Uh, lawsuits by uh, different kind of uh, people. Um, and, you know, there are people who are actually, uh, you know, you, uh, bringing out the fact that his attempt to overturn the uh, the results of the 2020 election is something that should not be, uh, that should actually uh, include punishment, which is fair. But the thing is that it is going to be very, very difficult for, uh, you know, uh, courts to prove. Nevertheless, there is a federal attempt as well happening. So we need to wait and see how that is going to happen. But as I said, he's using the, these uh, cases as well as, uh, you know, uh, sort of a judicial victory uh, over his opponents. He's trying, he has framed the Colorado uh, judgment as a ma massive victory and, you know, mentioned that frequently in a speech uh, in Iowa where he's, you know, now frequently campaigning. It is one of those early voting states that is that pretty much, uh, you know, begins the whole primaries process for uh, both Democrats and Republicans. So this is a massive, uh, very sort of blitzkrieg kind of campaign that is happening. And he's pretty much using all of these cases and, you know, which uh, the verdicts as well, the rulings of whether or not, you know, uh, which might actually not deal with uh, whether or not he, uh, you know, uh, inspired this insurrection, but definitely, uh, you know, is coming out of uh, institutional uh, challenges, but he's trying to reframe that as, uh, you know, a moral or, a, you know, judicial victory over his opponents. So he's pretty much trying to make everything, every kind of uh, criminal uh, case or, you know, even federal cases against him as, a, 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 you know, an attack against him and using that to play the victim card in many ways uh, in and, you know, trying to uh, rally his supporters. Uh, for his campaign. Well, Anish, thank you so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you. Definitely a long one year ahead. Lots of verdicts, definitely also lots of electoral contests. We'll come back to you regularly.
Over the past few days, tech news has been dominated by one company, that's OpenAI, which is behind ChatGPT and many other products. The company's CEO and face of ChatGPT, Sam Altman, was fired a few days ago by the board, and Chairman and President Greg Brockman quit in protest. The pendulum swung dramatically in the face of a looming revolt by employees, and there were attempts to get Altman and Brockman back. But when the dust settled, Altman and key colleagues were headed to Microsoft, OpenAI had a new CEO, and most of its employees were calling for the resignation of the board. But this is not merely an issue of boardroom intrigue. OpenAI's decisions and directions may have serious implications, and in fact is a matter of concern for all of us. We go to tech analyst Bapa Sina for more. Bapa, thank you so much for joining us. So OpenAI in the news, uh, and this time not for product-related reasons or you know, uh, or AI-related reasons, but for uh, boardroom drama and intrigue, it's been quite, uh, you know, quite a few days. You know, first Sam Altman is fired, <coughs> then you know there are discussions that he's going to come back. Then they have a new CEO, and then Sam Altman and some of his key colleagues are joining Microsoft of all companies. So, uh, but of course, behind all this, there's also a lot of debate about some of the larger issues regarding AI, which we'll get to. But first of all, your quick thoughts on uh, what this means for. Uh, does this mean anything at all for OpenAI and what does it mean that some of these key people associated with uh, this technology are moving to Microsoft? Right. So um, I think Rama best describes what has been going on because it's been difficult to keep track of all the happenings at OpenAI. I mean, uh, it's fairly shocking that uh, Sam Altman and Greg um, Brockman, the, uh, the president and the CEO of uh, OpenAI were um, uh, just fired um, apparently on a Google Meet call, right? Um, so not even in person. Um, as you know, Sam Altman kind of had become a uh, celebrity by promoting ChatGPT. And um, he is the most recognizable face for the general public um, of um, representing uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT. So for him to suddenly get fired was a shocker to everybody. And um, then the circumstances in which it happened, um, uh, uh, him leaving, and then um, they trying to call him back. And it, it appeared that he was coming back. And then now uh, he's not coming back. And like there, there are now um, uh, uh, rumors or, or, or stories about uh, not just um, uh, Sam Altman uh, and, and some of the senior leadership, but a bulk of the open AI engineers moving to uh, Microsoft. So, so it, it, it's quite a boardroom uh, drama. Now, to look uh, when you kind of read the analysis behind it, there have been attempts to make it out to be a battle between uh, the 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 people who are more for ethical AI, right? Like people trying to caution about the use of ethical AI, uh, caution about the use of AI, and, and that kind of been. Um, led by the the chief scientist of OpenAI, the um, his, his name is Ilya uh, Satskeva, right? And um, and Sam Altman, who is like the more traditional Silicon Valley uh, CEO who, who who wants to uh, monetize it and and get like uh, the, the fastest, quickest way to monetize it and uh, get big valuation. So so while it has been presented as a battle between these two opposing camps um, or or opposing ideas of how open ai should evolve uh, frankly i find it difficult to to kind of um assign ethical values to any of this bunch right i mean um uh, ilya satkevers uh, at least a uh, stated version is that that he 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 fears that open ai uh, that that chat gpt the open ai products in general right are close to uh, what is called AGI, artificial general intelligence, and um, uh, for for those who don't know, uh, there is the, the, the AI community makes this uh, distinction between regular machine learning and artificial general intelligence. Regular machine learning is AI having to um, um, being able to do certain tasks, which we are used to, right? Where we are used to um, Google uh, AI able to recognize images. Uh, about uh, correcting uh, text, uh, prompting for text, we are, we are used to those things, right? And ChatGPT kind of advances that frontier. But um, artificial general intelligence is is supposed to be far more than these uh, pointed, like 
particular task. Artificial general intelligence is having a human-like intelligence, right? Where you are, um, you, you don't get good at one or two tasks, but you think like humans and are able to adapt to pretty much any task that's given to you. Um, now to claim that they are on the verge of, their ethics guy claiming that they are on the verge of artificial general intelligence seems to me fairly unethical, right? Because um, frankly, we are nowhere close to artificial general intelligence. And, and there are people who argue that the current um, model of AI, the, the, the current direction in which AI has gone, there is no path to artificial general intelligence along these lines. So to claim that this AI will become like the science fiction, like Matrix, where AI becomes evil and takes over humankind, uh, that's that's really far-fetched. To me, it just it like seems like a clash of personalities on who is going to control uh, open AI because it's become fairly valuable, right? I mean, there, there are talks about its valuation in in like tens of billions, closer, probably closer to hundred billion dollars. So 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 clearly there is a lot of money involved. Right, Baba, of course, the larger question behind a lot of this is, you know, what use is or how is AI used in uh, society at this point? You know, and I guess there are many dimensions to it. Like you said, one is the fact that it is currently being used in various kinds of tasks. Uh, there's a question of regulation, for instance, which, you know, very little has actually been done about it, although there's been a lot of talk about it as well. But how uh, does this uh, does this current battle in any sense touch upon some of those larger issues in terms of how uh, you know, AI itself needs to be sort of, uh, say, harnessed for the benefit of a larger community as opposed to making, a, uh, making the billions you're talking about. Right. And, and I think this, this uh, the, the camp, the, the Ilya camp is kind of projecting that that's what, that's where they're getting to, right? And these are all billionaires and, and uh, or, or at least multi-millionaires and, and they, they have formed this thing called um, um, a philanthropic group, right? Uh, they, they call it uh, practical philanthropy or, or, or something like that, right? I mean, I, I forget the exact um, uh, term they use. And, and, and they claim that they want uh, uh, AI, which will be more, uh, uh, they want, um, they, they don't, they're not really calling for uh, government regulation, right? What they're calling is for the AI community to self-regulate and make sure that you don't uh, go and develop um, like what they are, they are claiming rogue AI, right? But I don't think the problem really is about uh, 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 a human-like AI uh, going rogue. I, I don't think that is the threat we face. The threat we face is much more banal, which is um, the, the AI is used in in lot of cases for um, providing for for providing or restricting access to government services, right? And uh, for example, AI, um, we know AI has been used for uh, determining um, jail sentences for, for, for uh, uh, convicted uh, criminals or getting access to um, uh, welfare schemes, right? By, by claiming that they can, they can weed out fraud or by um, determining insurance claims, right? Now there, AI is evil in much more banal way, right? It has been trained so that access to insurance claims, access to um, welfare schemes um, are basically denied to people, hiding behind that, oh, it is not human bias, but it is a, a neutral machine, which is kind of reaching these conclusions. And um, really the, 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 the solution to that is in many cases to, to reject the idea that uh, that you you can come up with these metrics and and uh, kind of have AI intelligently decide on who who gets access and who doesn't get access because these machines are trained to deny to 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 kind of lean towards denying access right and and, and so then it, it really comes to the political um, and that dimension right that that you you uh, do you really want to whittle down the state and do you want to to get into an um, austerity mode or not, or, or, or do you want to give people universal access and all? And that's uh, that's really a debate about politics, um, debate in politics, like what kind of society you want, and then uh, and from there follows what technology will do for you, right? Rather than it being the other way around, where where um, you are claiming that you have this uh, super intelligent uh, neutral, uh, like politics neutral AI, which kind of intelligently figures out um, 
things, right? And and, and I think none of these, um, uh, none of the people who are in the AI industry, right? And especially th th this AI industry, which is uh, the Silicon Valley uh, VC led companies, none of them are really talking about that. I mean, they're actually talking about the opposite of that. Right, Papa, and I think a key question at this point, because this is something we regularly look on this show, is for countries of the global south, you know, where do, like, for instance, uh, we know that ChatGPT is now very popular in, uh, in India and many countries in the global south, but, you know, the way uh, that is really, for most of us, the understanding of what AI is at this point, in the sense, or some of the applications you talked about connected to Google and stuff. But really, for countries in the global south, where is the entry point when it comes to uh, the question of AI itself, in terms of where do you sort of, uh, away from these kind of boardroom drama and battles involving billions, but where decisions are being made, which might affect many of us because some of the products that uh, you know are made might just be uh, adopted almost uncritically by governments, by state governments, by various institutions here. So for countries in the global south, is there really uh, an entry point at this, at this point of time? I mean, Right now, um, most of the AI research, like the, the, the AI research in, in these kinds of fields, like the chat GPT, like AI, that is really so expensive, right? That like, forget about the South, right? Even uh, countries in the developed world, even, even uh, government institutions in the developed world can't afford that, right? I mean, uh, in the case of op uh, open AI, they got a $10 billion funding from Microsoft. And most of that was to purchase the hardware, the, 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 the compute um, um, platform on which their AI was, was going to run on, right? And so this category of AI um, really requires a huge amount of funding, which is not available to most government institutions or, or, or universities, right? It's only available to these VC funded very high um, uh, very heavily funded um, startups and or or companies like Google and Facebook, which are I mean, which are sitting on a, a boatload of cash, right? So um, uh, now, I mean, that being said, AI can do useful things, or AI could be made to do useful things. It could help you in industrial automation. It could help you uh, in in um, uh, manufacturing. Um, it, it could give you an advantage in, in many uh, industrial domains, right? And uh, that would require um, investment in AI, which would help you not for, for the entertainment industry or for the advertisement industry, but to be focused on society's needs, right? Now, but that's a that's a huge that's not where silicon valley wants to invest right exactly and so that requires governments in the global south to come together to pool their scanty resources in comparison to what um, silicon valley has and try to like with any technology try to see if that technology can be made uh, uh, can can be made uh, to serve the interests of the people at large and, and not a few uh, millionaires and billionaires that would probably be a true understanding of what ethical is in this context as opposed to how that word is being used in this recent debate. Thank you so much, Bapa, for explaining some of the nuances of this debate to us. Thanks. That's all we have in today's episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. In the meanwhile, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit that subscribe button.